on this fourth Sunday in Advent. I'm Charmaine Norton, a member of the Bethany community. We are so glad you decided to worship with us today. Welcome to you if you are hopeful or weary or a little bit of each, certain or doubtful or a little bit of each, fearful or peaceful or a little bit of each, black or brown or white or a little bit of each, straight or queer or a little bit of each, quietly waiting in the dark night of winter, restlessly searching for the light or a little bit of each. Welcome to you all. This is a place to remember. I am a child of God, holy and beloved. Please say that again with me. I, I am, am a child, child of God, God holy and, and beloved. beloved. We come just as we are to this season of holy waiting. All are welcome. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Let us worship together. you now to take a moment to quiet yourself as we prepare for a time of confession and as we get to hear the wonderful words of assurance. If you hear nothing else this morning, what's most important for you to hear is that you are a child of God, holy and beloved. Nothing can take that identity away from you. When we say this, we also mean that each and every person is a child of God. Our task is to honor the image of God in ourselves and in each other. And in the Christian tradition, when we confess sin, we're simply looking honestly at what gets in the way of us doing just that. And therefore, that which gets in our way as we seek to know the love of God that is being born in one another can be removed as we humbly confess. I invite you now to listen to this prayer that I offer of confession and the forgiveness for all of us. Before God and with the people of God, we confess our brokenness to the ways we wound ourselves and the lives of others in the life of God's world. Together we remember, and we live out the deep assurance of our faith that God forgives us, that Christ renews us, and the Spirit enables all of us to grow in love. Amen. And now, as a community of friends and family gathered in spirit to nourish our faith together and give witness to the always present love of God, I offer you the peace of Christ. Please greet one another with the peace and love that is God's gift to us this day. Take a moment to write your blessings in the comments section and to check in with our community.
for an amazing thing, the long-awaited Messiah who comes to us all. We wait, we prepare, we make straight the way. We await the coming of Christ with the lighting of Advent candles. On the first three Sundays of Advent, we lit the candles of hope, peace, and joy. Today we light the candle of love. No other word so adequately captures what we know of God. God so loved the world that a child was born. Love was made flesh and lived among us, teaching, healing, and showing us how to be God's love in the world. We, we are, are a people of love. We light the candle of love. We, we are, are a people of love. Hi, Bethany. Happy Sunday. I hope you all are doing well. I wanted to mention this Sunday how much I'm thinking about you guys, the adults and the kiddos. Um, this Sunday would normally be our nativity or our Christmas play, and I just miss seeing everyone, everyone coming together to put that, uh, that show together. I miss the little ones dressed up like angels and farm animals and, uh, and the older ones memorizing lines and just practicing together. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I miss you and I hope this time next year that we'll be able to be together and do that again. So this Sunday in honor of our regular nativity, I'm just going to read the classic story of Jesus being born, our Christmas story. And this is just from my regular children's Bible I have. And I did have the page open, but you know how these things go. 
sure I'll find it. Not the story of Jacob. Not the story of Daniel and the lion. Not even close. Here we go. He's here. Everything was ready. The moment God had been waiting for was here at last. God was coming to help his people, just as he promised in the beginning. But how would he come? What would he be like? What would she do? Mountains would have bowed down. Seas would have roared. Trees would have clapped their hands. But the earth held its breath. As silent as snow falling, God came in. And when no one was looking, in the darkness, God came. There was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. One morning, this girl was minding her own business when suddenly a great warrior of light appeared right there in her bedroom. How do you think the girl feels, Lucy? If a great giant warrior of light came into this room, how would you feel? Scared. Yeah, scared. I bet that Mary felt a little scared too. The warrior of light was Gabriel and he was an angel, a special messenger from heaven. When she saw the tall, shining man standing there, Mary was frightened. You don't need to be scared, Gabriel said. God is very happy with you. Mary looked around to see if possibly he was talking to somebody else. Mary, Gabriel said, and he laughed with such gladness that Mary's eyes filled with sudden tears. Mary, you're going to have a baby, a little boy. You will call him Jesus. He is God's own son. God, uh, he's the one. He's the rescuer. The God who flung planets into space, the God who made the universe, was making himself small and coming down as a baby. Wait, God was sending a baby to rescue the world? <laughs> but it's too wonderful, Mary said, and felt her heart beating hard. How can it be true? Is anything too wonderful for God? Yes, <laughs> Gabriel asked. So Mary trusted God more than what her eyes could see, and she believed. I am God's servant, she said. Whatever God says, I will do. Sure enough, it was just as the angel had said. Nine months later, Mary was almost ready to have her baby. Now Mary and Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem, the town King David was from. But when they reached the little town, they found every room was full. Every bed was taken. Go away, the innkeeper told them. There isn't any place for you. Where would they stay? Soon Mary's baby would come. They couldn't find anywhere except an old tumble-down stable. So they stayed where the cows and the donkeys and the horses stayed. And there in the stable amongst the chickens and the donkeys and the cows, in the quiet of the night, God gave the world God's wonderful gift. The baby that would change the world was born, God's baby son. Mary and Joseph wrapped him up to keep him warm. They made a soft bed of straw and used the animal's feeding trough as his cradle. And they gazed in wonder at God's great gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mary and Joseph named him Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us because, of course, God has. What do you think about that story, Lou? It was great. It was great. What was your favorite part? The baby um, saved the world. <laughs> the baby saved the world. Is that kind of confusing? Mm -hmm. How do you think a baby saved the world? Because he's Jesus. Because he's Jesus. Yeah. He came down as God. Um, yeah. Happy Sunday, everybody. Again, I miss you. I hope to see you soon. It's wonderful hearing um, hearing from you um, during service. It's lovely seeing your guys' videos, the candle lighting, any way that you help out in the service, kids and adults. It's just, it's just nice. One way to be together through all this craziness. So anyway, happy Sunday, y'all. I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Can you say bye, Lucy? Bye. <laughs> Listen to the word which God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at Listen to the voice behind creation. Listen even if you don't understand. Listen to the word which God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice behind creation. Listen even if you don't understand.
This morning's reading is a song sung by a young girl after she learned she would carry in her womb the spirit-blessed Son of God. It is a passage that has come to be known simply as Mary's song. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. Good morning, Bethany. It's so good to be with you today. I always so much enjoy being here to see all your faces, which I can't see this morning, but you're in my mind's eye. Think back to a time in your life when a song had transformative power for you, when a song seemed to capture both the forces of history and the passions of your own heart in such a way that the first couple of stanzas flooded you with emotion and memories and visions of what has been or what could be. If you all were sitting here in the sanctuary, I would ask you to shout out the names of some of those songs and maybe even sing a line or two. Chances are others would be able to sing along with you because songs, especially important songs that strike to the core of communal pain and aspirations, stay with us a really long time. The ones that come to my mind, given my generation, are protest songs that spoke of the turmoil and grief and hope of the civil rights movement, war, and the ongoing peace and justice efforts of the 60s and 70s. I can still feel the longing of Trini Lopez's If I Had a Hammer, the anxious foreboding of Buffalo Springfield, something is happening here, the grief of Judy Collins's version of Where Have All the Flowers Gone, and Buffy St. Marie's Universal Soldier, and then of course the indignation of Barry McGuire's Eve of Destruction and the a cappella beauty of Joni Mitchell's the fiddler and the drum. And, of course, the honest hope of Bob Dylan's The Times They Are at Changing. And most predominantly, We Shall Overcome, an African-American anthem sung by Joan Baez at the 1963 March on Washington. There are more, of course. Every generation has its list. You have yours. I know that you do. And no matter how many years go by, when we hear them, we are transported back in time to a particular event, or emotion, or idea, or ethos that likely shaped us profoundly and forever. Why is that? Well, there seems to be something about the intersection of melody and lyric that has the power to transfix us and move us and enliven our imaginations and our vision and to propel us forward, often into something brand new. Song can alter mood, impact how we see the world around us, bring people together and fuel social bonds. Not only that, but science has discovered that songs actually change the way our brains work, bringing about chemical responses that open us to new patterns of thinking. Even when there is no instrument, singing together can take on a life of its own and move the soul in ways that few other things can. And singing together causes a sense of well-being 
especially when we know a song well enough that we can foresee what's coming next. And that is why little kids will drive you nuts singing the same song again and again and again. They are committing it to deep, deep memory. What we have today in the form of Mary's song are the ideas and values and faith and hope committed into the deep, deep memory of the Jewish people. A song that had survived centuries of untold pain and hardship. A song that lifted the souls of the people time after time as they suffered and rallied and strove forward again and again and again into the future God intended for them. The roots of Mary's song can be found in the Hebrew scriptures, songs of God bringing about amazing reversals, lifting up the lowly, bringing down the powerful, setting people on a new course of justice and mercy. Go way back and you find Miriam's song of thanksgiving and praise, sang as she danced on the shores of the Red Sea, the Israelites having just escaped the clutches of Pharaoh. And we have Hannah's spirit-filled song of thanksgiving for all God had done and would do through the birth of her son, Samuel. Samuel grew to become a great prophet. It was he who anointed King David. Hannah's song is in some places nearly identical to Mary's. That's how we know these songs are related. The Lord raises the poor from the dust to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For not by might does one prevail, she sings. Songs of reversal and transformation and hope, and probably most often sung in the context of worship, had sustained the people for centuries and centuries, reminding them of who God is, what God has done, and what the future would hold, no matter what their lot in life at any given time. And you know, Mary's lot was not good. There was so much trouble in the world. She was a little girl, really, maybe only about 14. Engaged to an older man named Joseph, she was pregnant, likely poor, probably uneducated, living all of her life under the oppressive and violent thumb of the Romans, living near the bottom of the social scale with very few rights and hardly any freedom. Yet. Through the Spirit's movement in her life, she knew in her heart that the child she would bring into the world was a Spirit-filled child of God. In fact, the Spirit-born Son of God, who would somehow reverse the fortunes of the people, transform their reality, marshal their energy, speak to their souls, and move their hearts and minds to a love they had never experienced before. And so Luke tells us that she sang. A song she'd made known all her, her life, we don't know, or maybe. It was Luke who decided to interject this poetic song into the story. Because he knew how the ministry of Jesus would be oriented towards justice for the outcast and the forgotten and the invisible ones. He knew that a familiar anthem could communicate who Jesus would be, what his values would be, and how God would save through him. What we have bequeathed to us in this scripture is a song of the people, a song of resistance to the oppression enveloping their lives, a song of reversal of the fortunes of the poor, a song ultimately of praise to the one Mary knew through her child would save her people, no matter how dismal their future looked. The mighty one has done great things for me, she sings, shown strength of his arm, scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts, brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. What intrigues me 
about Mary's song is that it does not talk about what God will do, but what God has already done. God has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has already filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So there it is. That is the key. The promise is not what God will do, but rather what God has done already. But do you, like me, have a hard time seeing the evidence that God has reversed all the pain and the suffering and the racism and the violence and the disease and the pandemic? and unemployment, and political oppression, and economic havoc afoot in the world today, right now? What are we to make of Mary's perception of what God has done when the world around her was surely in far worse shape than even our own? I wasn't sure how to answer that until I listened to Pastor Jenny on the first Sunday of Advent, give a wonderful, wonderful sermon entitled, How Can I Keep From Singing? Jenny told us that the dark and quiet of Advent, no matter what is happening in the world, gives us time for our eyes to adjust, even where there is darkness all around, so that we can truly see the activity of God. Hope is born in darkness, she said. And likewise, I think that Advent gives us a time to adjust our ears to the ancient song of God, who created humanity for love and for equality, for compassion, for community, not for hierarchy and power games and systemic racism and violence and oppression. If we adjust our perception and see through the eyes of faith, like Mary, we begin to perceive something that seemingly doesn't exist in the limited vision of the world, but which is active and true and productive and real in the kingdom of God. And we begin to hear the song God has been singing since the beginning of creation, since the time of Miriam and Hannah, and Mary. We begin to let it fire our imaginations. We begin to allow it to transform us. We begin to imagine the world under the sway and of the reign of Jesus, and then to set our hearts to living that out. That is the journey of Advent. In fact, that is the journey of our very lives. We heard Aaron sing on the first Sunday of Advent. My life goes on in endless song Above earth's lamentations I hear the real, the far off hymn That hails a new creation Through all the tumult and the strife I hear its music ringing it sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? I hear that song, and I am filled with the wonder and hope that Mary must have felt singing her song. But to tell you the truth, I can't sing hers with real integrity because I have lived on the privileged side of the social scale. I'm white, I'm educated, I'm by no means wealthy, but compared to most of the world, I am way rich. Mary's song is a song God has given to the poor, those discriminated against, those hungry, those persecuted. I pretty much sit on my throne of privilege while others suffer. 
I fill my mouth with food and I have shelter while others have neither food nor home. Am I among those who will be cast down in the realm of God? The vision of Mary's song reveals? Maybe so. At least that question has caused me serious work of spiritual reflection and confession. As I come to the manger at Christmas, I had better come on my knees. And yet, and yet my heart thrills to the lyrics of songs proclaiming God's love and justice for all people. My heart still thrills to the vision of a great leveling occurring so that everyone can experience God's heart for equality. My heart thrills to the belief that it was in the birth of Jesus that God sang and continues to sing to the whole world and bids us to get off our thrones of privilege and influence and join in the singing. Mary's song is not so much for people like me to sing, but for people like me to listen to and hear and then respond. In our society today, that song belongs to black, indigenous people of color. It belongs to those who are struggling economically. It belongs to GLBTQ folks. It is their communities that have suffered in the hierarchy of human relationships. Listen to a powerful fragment of a song born of the people who labored under the burdens of slavery and poverty and the thumb of the throne-sitting proud white folks around them. Lift every voice and sing. Mary, I am sure, would sing with them. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. When I first heard a gospel choir sing that song, I was so moved as they bore witness to faith in what God has done, even when it might not be evident in their lives. And I've tried to shape my life, albeit very imperfectly, to reflect that reality. Thrones and privileges are hard things to release, but we need to do just that. It's not the wealthy that can show us the activity of God. It's not the educated. It's not the powerful. It's not those sitting on thrones. It is the humble ones, the broken, the ignored, the heavy burdened who hear the ancient song of God and break forth in songs of faith powerful enough to move all of us and unite our faith and empower our witness. That is the biggest reversal, the biggest Christmas miracle of all. That is where Christ is being born anew. Just five more days until Christmas morning. Our Advent time of waiting is almost over. So I would urge you to spend that time listening for the song of Christ. Attune your ears to the songs and to the voices that we usually do not take the time to hear. Acknowledge the reversals really are already happening in the kingdom of God. And then orient your life towards living like you believe it. Orient your life to the love and justice so ancient and so powerful that you cannot keep from singing. Bless you. Merry Christmas.
good to be worshiping with all of you. If you're new to the Bethany community, we, we welcome you and are especially happy that you've joined us this morning. We'd love to get to know you and to welcome you into the life of this vibrant community of faith. We are a community that prays for one another, that cares for our neighbors and for the wider world. And we love to ask questions here as we seek to live out the love of God in our daily lives. If you'd like to know more about the church and how to get involved, you can email Katie at bethanypresstacoma at gmail.com or message us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you. On behalf of the session and the members of this church, we thank you for the many ways that you continue to give to the life of this community of faith. Each year during the Advent and Christmas season, we turn our eyes to Bethlehem and celebrate the wondrous gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. By giving to the Christmas joy offering, you honor God's gift of Jesus Christ by providing assistance to current and retired church workers in their time of need and developing our future leaders at Presbyterian related schools and colleges equipping communities of color. The Christmas Joy Offering has been a cherished Presbyterian tradition since the 1930s. The offering distributes gifts equally to the assistance program of the Board of Pensions and to Presbyterian-related schools and colleges equipping communities of color. The assistant program, assistance program provides critical financial support to church workers and their families. Presbyterian-related schools and colleges provide education and leadership development while nurturing racial and ethnic heritage. This has been a Presbyterian commitment for nearly 140 years. Please consider con contributing to this special offering if you are able in the next few weeks. We will be dedicating this offering on the last Sunday in the, of the year. You can donate by sending a check directly to the church or via PayPal at bethanytacoma.org forward slash give. No matter how you give, please be sure to designate that the funds are for the Christmas joy offering in the memo lines. Your generosity is very appreciated. Thank you, Bethany. As we gather our hearts and minds in prayer, I invite you to write down your prayer requests or concerns in the comments section during the song of prayer. What are your sorrows? What are your fears? What are your joys? What's giving you life? These are the things that we can share with one another. Baby boy, one day rule the nation. 
that you've given to each of us and for your calling to us to serve your world in your name. We ask special blessings today upon all who are suffering, upon those who are homeless, upon those who are imprisoned, upon those who are mourning and in grief, upon those who are so lonely and are struggling with this time of isolation as we face the COVID virus. We pray for the leaders of our state and our county and our city and of our country. It is an important time to support those who lead us and for those leaders to listen carefully to your message of caring for and providing for the needs of all of your people. We pray for your church, not simply here at Bethany, not simply across the city of Tacoma and the county of Pierce, but throughout the world. For Presbyterians and Methodists, for Catholics, for Orthodox, for Methodists, for all the various denominations that make up your community of faith. Give them strength and give them courage and walk alongside of them, that together we might proclaim the joyful good news that Christ is the light of the world. And because we are your people and because we go by your name, we're bold enough to pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bethany is an active community of faith, even in these different times. There are still groups feeding virtually, and there are still ways for you to be involved. So we invite you to check out our, our weekly digital newsletter. This is posted on our Facebook page each week, but you can also sign up for our emailing list on our website or by contacting Katie in the church office. We will be offering a Christmas Eve service this Thursday at 7 p.m. The service will be broadcast the same as our Sunday services on Facebook. We invite you to join us on Christmas Eve as we share this special service in a new way. Also, Bible studies are being held via Zoom on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. and Tuesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join either of these groups, please email the church office and Katie will get you on the mailing list. Also, we invite you to our Zoom coffee hour immediately following worship today. There is a link in the description of this video to get to the meeting. We hope you can pop in and say hi. Brothers and sisters of faith, go out into the world in peace. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, love and honor everyone, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to you. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all, now and forever. Amen.